So uh, I will be speaking now uh, about something that is happening in the micro world. And uh, in uh, this uh, uh, slide, you can see the content that I will be speaking about. So the first uh, issue that I will be mentioning is that one of the problems of the health care and medicine today is that uh, the fact that the uh, population is uh, aging very rapidly. And uh, it's uh, the statistics that shows that the uh, population over 65 uh, will be more than 30% uh, as expected for the uh, end of the century. So uh, though we are very happy, all of us individually and as a community, that the uh, people are living much longer, but uh, it also causes the uh, <clears throat> uh, special, um, it's the special uh, uh, Target to the healthcare system because the costs of the uh, caring of the elderly people is increasing. In this slide, you can see some of these expectations for the next uh, future. So, uh, from the slide on my right hand side, uh, in the period of 2002 to the period of 2012, that means in approximately 10 years, the uh, average age of the population in uh, Europe for both men and women have increased nearly two years. And uh, the uh, annual uh, growth of the uh, per capita income in Europe is not so good as compared to the costs. So the green columns here are showing the growth of the healthcare costs in different uh, countries in uh, uh, European Union, while the red ones are showing the annual average growth of uh, the uh, uh, per capita. So, sorry, the green are the costs and the, the red is the growth of the income per capita. And you can see actually that uh, in most cases for most of the countries in the European Union, the growth of the health cost is much higher than the growth of the per capita. Only Ireland uh, was uh, uh, able to show the results different from this. So what is actually aging? We all understand very well the chronological aging, but uh, recently another term has been brought to the discussion about aging, and that is the so-called biological age, which actually enables uh, modeling of the perspectives of each person, because uh, there are several models that have been introduced in order to uh, model the, this uh, future and shape it hopefully as well. And uh, the uh, it, the parameters that are included in, the, included in these uh, models are the chronological age, some genetics, but a lot of lifestyle, nutrition, and uh, other conditions that uh, may be uh, actually uh, showing some of the perspectives for the person's future. Uh, how is it possible to keep the biological age of a person lower than the chronological one? The uh, practical results that we can use is that the exercising and physical activity are one of the parameters that are actively uh, contributing to keeping the biological age lower. And then there are also some other parameters. However, we must understand that this keeping of the biological age lower than the chronological, it's not a miracle. It's perhaps something that spends about five to 10 years in, in a person's uh, uh, life. So the other thing that we have to know is that uh, due to uh, aging of the population, actually people uh, uh, develop different kinds of chronic diseases and therefore it is very important to follow up their physical state. And uh, that may be, uh, of course, uh, achieved by monitoring of the vital signs of the human physiology. But it was also shown that uh, emotional or physical condition of a person is uh, uh, very much influencing the uh, altogether uh, uh, state of uh, human health and well-being. 
and therefore the number of these parameters that uh, might be good to be uh, followed up is uh, much larger. So what we are trying uh, to do, let's say in medicine and in uh, healthcare today is to follow up the quality of life of the person, which then does not include only the uh, state of uh, healthiness or being uh, sick, but also the happiness of the persons. And that is, of course, different for each person individually. So uh, what are the technologies that may be uh, helping in uh, following the current status of a person's health and well-being? And uh, what uh, we would also like to get from this data is uh, something for the modeling of the perspectives of the uh, potential risks uh, for the future of a particular person so that uh, this health risk may be reached and uh, probably lowered by uh, uh, interventions, uh, medical and all the others. On the right hand side, uh, you can actually see a lot of uh, technologies that have been proposed for uh, reaching of this purpose. Well, on the first place, there is variable technology followed by smart, smart algorithms for analyzing all these data that are being uh, collected. And the newly, something that's uh, is popular uh, in uh, introduction to the medical and healthcare problems is the so-called artificial intelligence. That means some of the algorithms that make decisions uh, without intervention of uh, the persons uh, from healthcare. So in order to make this possible, all the stakeholders must be uh, intro introduced into the solving of the problem. What we actually know without much uh, uh, research is that the system is expensive and it may be inefficient and unsuitable. Therefore, uh, this uh, uh, preventional aspect of these actions have to be, has to be introduced into education of the younger generations so that they take much higher responsibility in taking care of their health. The problem with the technology that uh, is currently used for monitoring of the physiological function of, of, of the population, and we are talking now primarily about the elderly population, is that the dropout in the using is uh, relatively high. Let's say with the persons after the my myocardial infraction, they stop taking uh, care and uh, carrying any kind of the monitors uh, uh, regularly after approximately three months after the cardiac incident. So what uh, must be achieved with all this technology is the minimal disruption to the user, where we can say that the nanotechnologies that uh, were mentioned in uh, earlier uh, uh, lectures today and, uh, and yesterday probably will make uh, possible due to miniaturization and uh, due to lowering the power and consumption of such uh, uh, sensing uh, uh, units and uh, of the needs for any further uh, processing of the information that's getting uh, to the results of the uh, monitoring. Then it has to be proven in the utility. A large uh, number of the gadgets and medical devices that are being uh, today wearable is uh, rejected by the uh, population due to, let's say, a large number of false alarms. That means that the reliability of these devices has to be uh, increased. And then we come again to the eligible costs of use, which means that uh, the uh, question whether the healthcare system, the social one, is the carrier of the costs or the person, potential patient, uh, is that person who has to carry the costs. Uh, finally, the feasibility to integrate uh, such devices into the healthcare system is an important uh, 
uh, issue and uh, perhaps a little bit later we will touch this uh, issue again. So there is a number of bioelectrical, biomechanical uh, signals and quantities that uh, uh, can be and that already are being uh, tracked by different kinds of uh, uh, variable sensors. Uh, today, uh, uh, the, the uh, aim is also to include the biochemical quantities, uh, primarily very successful in uh, bl blood uh, sugar level monitoring, which became continuous these uh, days. So uh, from those technologies that I will touch today, because it's obvious that it doesn't fit into 30 minute lectures, are the sensors themselves and the sensors being uh, uh, enlarged to wearable wireless intelligent sensors with adding some of the electronics. Uh, then the integration of different kinds of sensors into wireless sensor networks, the way how to transmit this data to some kind of a storage and uh, processing uh, unit, which uh, very often has to be uh, somewhere out, not embedded into the uh, sensor uh, in itself, no matter how intelligent the sensor may be. And uh, there are also some other issues that may be mentioned if time enough. Uh, so which uh, the issues in which uh, my department and my co-workers are included is uh, the policies on health aging. Recently, we had a uh, large conference in Zagreb, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, focused on the future of healthy aging. And also some uh, policy documents were produced that uh, will be introduced uh, into the policy of the European Union. Uh, the second uh, line that we are having in our research is the research of variable wireless intelligence sensors. So there are some of the later latest publications uh, in this field mentioned on this slide. We also organize these intelligent sensors into wireless sensor networks. And finally, uh, we were studying the patient monitoring from the point uh, of uh, the most effective way to transmit the data or the signals uh, that means in the field of the telemetry. On this slide, you can see some of the sensors that we have been uh, developing. On the left hand side is an older version, and uh, on the right hand side is a more uh, recent one. As you can see here, we are uh, reducing the size of the devices and uh, by the same time we are also making such changes that we can reduce the power consumption. So from the point of view of the uh, intention of such sensors, it is that uh, we uh, uh, monitor physical activity of the patients and also that we uh, try to uh, convince them to use the same devices for monitoring of their efforts in exercising. And uh, what we are trying to do is to uh, monitor the exercising quantitatively and qualitatively. So the quantitative is relatively easy. That's the number of movements that the patient has been uh, doing during a, uh, uh, an exercise uh, uh, series. And the qualitative one is monitoring whether the person is doing the exercise in the correct way. So that prevention of any kind of, uh, let's say, uh, events that we do not want to happen, like some injuries or something like that, are preventing by the analysis of these uh, patterns of the movements. So uh, if you have a look at this slide here, and we'll see now what happens. Ah, yes. I will open all the, all the, um, parts of the slide. So from relatively noisy signals that you let's say get on the accelerometer by using of some calculations and extracting some of the features, uh, putting it into the vector field machine. And then finally, you can get some kind of uh, 
uh, recognition of a particular movement. And uh, if you look at the results, well, uh, if you want to make a very, very high resolution in differentiating of different uh, 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 daily activities, then the accuracy is not very high. Now, the real question is why would we really need to differentiate sitting up uh, uh, or, or stand, sorry, sitting down or standing up from lying down and uh, uh, standing up from a lying position. So uh, what we recommend is a much uh, uh, rougher classification, which uh, differentiates than the uh, high energy and low energy classes of uh, daily activities so that in such a case uh, accuracy can be reached that is more than 90 percent so for a general knowledge of uh, uh, the uh, level of the activity uh, of a particular person uh, that may be considered uh, as good enough but what we also want to get by uh, uh, asking the patients uh, to wear this sensor is to detect uh, some unwanted uh, hazardous events like falling down of these patients. So uh, here we do want to get a very high accuracy of the parameters uh, so that we can uh, have such a protocol where the false, that the uh, uh, false detection of false is minimized and the uh, false alarms are also minimized. So we have done uh, uh, some uh, acquisition of uh, uh, different uh, uh, daily activities and uh, different simulated falls in a number of uh, persons. And uh, we used several kinds of uh, feature extraction protocols so that uh, we finally came to a protocol which we uh, which we recommended in our latest uh, paper uh, on how to actually track and how to extract the, the false signals uh, out of the uh, uh, activities of daily living. So the procedure consists of detecting three parts of the uh, of the poles and then uh, uh, by different features of uh, these uh, parts of the signal it is possible to detect the poles with uh, uh, high accuracy and then as we said we want to integrate uh, more more uh, uh, measurements and uh, information uh, uh, acquisitions into these uh, sensors in our latest uh, model of course uh, in addition to these uh, um, integrated measurement units for uh, accelerometry for orientation that means the gyroscope and magnetometer we added also the possibility to uh, follow the heart rate and the ecg uh, this is of course not the only device that is uh, doing the same uh, uh, issues and uh, the real problem then happens that uh, you need to pick up this data some something or 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 a person has to analyze it in order to get some of the results so uh, the number of the, the different uh, sensors in the market is very very large uh, but still uh, do, during these covid pandemics uh, the who uh, was able to Proof that uh, carrying these gadgets and also instructing the, the, the information from them may be very useful in combating COVID-19 in terms of uh, getting some of the information uh, that uh, uh, are good predictors of uh, good early predictors of uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, Professor Krishnan and myself have been writing about that recently for UNESCO. It would be nice to have a better and more detailed uh, information on the ECG itself, but the problem with all these uh, wearable textile uh, 
uh, uh, units is that they are very, very much prone to different kinds of artifacts, which then uh, make uh, in some uh, time, in some periods of time during the daily activities, impossible to accurately detect the ECG itself. So as I said, we also integrated uh, several uh, sensors into a uh, network. The main, uh, let's say, uh, feature of the network is that there is a sensor that is uh, picking up different kinds of uh, physiological features. And then uh, there is some kind of a central processing unit that is uh, being organized in such a way that uh, in in the case of uh, uh, normal uh, physiological state of the person, the, uh, the data is not transferred into some kind of a cloud or something like that. Only if there is an alarm or warning uh, 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 result of the processing present, then the information is carried to the other uh, system parts. And uh, what this system that is being carried enables is entering some patient data that then in the combination with the information that is being accessed from the different sensors enables personalized health decisions at this lower level of data acquisition and processing. So different kinds of combinations of uh, sensors we were using can be seen in the left uh, hand side of the page. Five um, minutes, please. Yes, thank you. I'm aware of that. I'm on, on slide 31 now, and there are about 40. So the question that we have to ask ourselves when we are designing such kind of systems is uh, what uh, information we need and how much of this information is really needed. Because if you put 10 sensors to a person, the endurance of such uh, monitoring will be very, very short time. Anyway, the next issue is the telemetry. So even implant, implanted devices today have telemetry, but uh, up to very recently, uh, the uh, data was transferred to some kind of a base station and then needed uh, uh, further uh, information chain in order to transfer it to some uh, decision-making uh, place. And uh, the ICT today has uh, many different kinds of uh, technologies that are uh, enabling to transfer different kinds uh, of data through the uh, internet and the different kinds of networks to such a, a self-management system, which is then supported by the experts from outside, like this one from Taiwan. The problem today is that in addition to the different gadgets and uh, uh, medical devices that are bearable and that the patients are carrying, we can get it also uh, information from some wearable uh, medical devices uh, like the uh, insulin pumps that people are carrying. Finally, we have the implanted devices that also today may be connected to the, uh, to the network and uh, also some stationary medical devices like blood pressure measurements, me measurement devices that also uh, sometimes uh, are connected to the network and sent the information. So all this has to be integrated into a network uh, and then processed. And finally, in that case, we can hope to get some accurate results for predictions of the diseases. Anyway, in the field of the Internet of Things, uh, about 47% of this pie uh, is today uh, expected to be dealing with healthcare devices. As I said, the pacemakers were in uh, previous times connected to the network through some specialized devices, uh, which needed then uh, presence of uh, a person or a uh, system that uh, was uh, processing this data. Uh, some of that was also entered into the electronic health record of the patient. Today's implantable devices 
primarily the pacemakers have the low energy Bluetooth uh, connectivity that enables uh, transmission of the data through patients' uh, smartphones into the uh, network that is then uh, sending some feedback to the patient himself. Some of the data is also available to the patient uh, through an application that uh, he or she can uh, start at the moment from phone. So uh, what you can see actually is that uh, there is a large diversity of possibilities uh, of picking up the information organizing it and uh, making decisions that are in favor of patients and of the elderly. However, I see as the main problem currently, no matter how much we speak about artificial intelligence, uh, which would be uh, probably the most suitable tool for the analysis, is the trustfulness of the uh, data that is being uh, entered. The problem here is that uh, um, we have uh, like 7 billion people who are individuals and who in each moment act differently. So it's uh, very little that uh, can be permanently uh, uh, identified as a pattern of health and of the everyday living of a person uh, all the time, some changes have to be taken into, into calculation, and we will need some time more to organize this system so that it really becomes prevention and that it really uh, is able to detect uh, adverse effects in real time. That means on time for a particular person. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I will be happy to answer any question in case there is some more interest. Thank you. Professor Magyarevich, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Thank you. Which, in fact, uh, provided us a kind of overview of the activities of the International Federation for Medical and Biological Engineering. And I would like to profit by this occasion to extend to you our congratulations on the occasion Again. of election as a president elect of this international federation for Again. medical and biological engineering and to Again. wish you a lot of creative successes in your mission to encourage support represent and promote the worldwide medical and biological engineering community thank you very much uh, I would just like to say that uh, uh, I'm happy that the IFMB is endorsing the conferences in Moldova for at least three generations. And uh, also, uh, I see that the biomedical engineering uh, community in Moldova is very active. So I would like just to say that uh, currently nominations for different positions in the uh, in the governing bodies is open and also in a few days we will open the call for awards of the IFMBE, all those to be presented uh, at the World Congress next year in June in Singapore. So I think sincerely hope that the conditions uh, due to the pandemic will allow also face-to-face -face meetings and I hope that uh, many of you who I was listening to will also come to present your papers at the World Congress. Thank so. you very much for this information. And once again, much success to you as a president-elect. Now the open, the open, uh, the, the talk is open for discussion and allow me to put uh, this question. Uh, sure. We all know the famous book by Robert Freitas, Nanomedicine, yes. which was published, if I am right, in 1999, just at the edge of the millennium. Yes. And there was a kind of futuristic uh, description of um, how this um, health uh, caring system should be organized um, in the in the future of mankind. Yes. 
-hmm. And there was um, uh, really a very appealing picture that the body of, of uh, every uh, human uh, must be filled with a lot of sensors which will monitor every, every deviation from, from a normal state. And then the information from the centers will be gathered somewhere in the central processing unit. And this central processing unit will communicate to one, um, uh, I would say, governing system um, in the corresponding locality in order to immediately undertake actions if there are some first symptoms of, of something what should be treated immediately and certainly at nanoscale. I see now that um, uh, your developments um, uh, represent in a sense a step in that direction because this monitoring and, and analysis in real time of the data about physiological status of a human. It's really what is needed for early diagnostics and therefore for good health um, uh, conditions. My question, do you think that this futuristic picture by Freitas um, uh, would be really a practical goal for mankind or it is more, um, more a description of direction um, where um, uh, we all should go, um, but uh, uh, not um, uh, aiming and putting billions of sensors in every human's body. I am very much interested to hear your opinion on that. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Well, uh, at this stage of the development of healthcare systems, I may say that we are going in this uh, idealistic uh, direction to be able to gather as much information from a person as possible. Uh, well, uh, if you compare a uh, variable sensor to the other kind, that means to, uh, non, uh, uh, to, to the sensors that are not in direct contact with the person, of course, that is also a possible uh, uh, direction to go but it's much more expensive because then you have to fill in with different sensors the whole uh, environment of the person. And practically that is not uh, easy to achieve uh, for a person who is leaving his home or his room. But uh, uh, the direction is certainly in, 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 in uh, this sense, which means that with the introduction of electronic health records, we get, get the possibility to uh, gain all the information on one place. And then you can attach to that some uh, expert system, which today are called an artificial intelligence to solve some of the problems. You know, the question of whether you can do and whether you can intervene in real time, it's always uh, in a way questionable. But if you take uh, implantable defibrillator cardioverters as an example, and the first uh, uh, units were implanted into human body uh, some 50 years ago in 85 or 86, we can show that this is a completely autonomous system that is implanted into the body and based on the analysis of only intracardial uh, ECG it decides whether to shock the heart or not. And each implemented so shock is actually saving of uh, a human life. And one device of such a kind may uh, uh, implement uh, up to 70, 75 shocks. That means that mm -hmm. it can save 75 times somebody's life. And mm -hmm. can anybody imagine that if somebody needed this shock 75 times, that every time there would be somebody who would run to the first defibrillator, which may be automatic, somebody in the shopping center, university, or, or, or mm -hmm. cinema, bring it within five minutes to the person and apply the shocks? I think not. So a part of this future is already reached, but uh, in uh, very early prediction of uh, so many diseases, that are present, it still is a relatively far away future. Yeah, 
Okay. Thank you very much for your comprehensive answer. And again, I think that your activities in the International Federation will approach us to that future. I, sin I sincerely hope so. <laughs>